What a week it has been. The Dow Jones closed for the first time above 40,000. Global markets rallied on the back of cooler inflation and weaker retail sales, reaching new all-time highs and most of the major indexes putting in the highest weekly close ever, proving that there is still juice left in the tank. So where do we go from here? Today, we discuss that and take a deep dive into the consumer to gauge their health. Is the consumer weakening or are they actually strengthening? Today, we're gonna to talk about that as well as Russell 2000 earnings, yields, and what comes next after the Dow reaches major milestones. Will the bullish momentum continue? We've got a lot to talk about, so let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. Guys, if you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm let's get into it and it was quite the day in the market here today it wasn't a all green day but it wasn't an all red day we got quite hawkish fed speak and that saw technology take it on the chin led by nvidia microsoft and apple you know when fed speakers come out and say inflation is not moderating there could be rate hikes the market is going to get spooked by that and then we did actually see the market rotate into stuff like energy basic materials, you know, inflation hedges, commodity driven sectors. And that's just the thing when the market thinks inflation is going to rise, you know, we're going to see stuff like energy and basic materials get bit up quite significantly. But what really did help the S&P 500 here today was some of the big boys. Look at Berkshire, JP Morgan, Visa, MasterCard, Tesla, Amazon, Google, right? They were actually green and they were really, really green as well. Some of them flat. And that actually really did help the S&P 500 for the most part put out a positive day. We were up 0.14% here in the S&P 500. And coming off what has been a stellar week, this to end the week is actually really, really good. We did see at the top here, XLB, XLE, XME, GDX. These are all material commodity driven sectors. They were the top performers. Outside of those, best performing sector was XLF Financials and then KRE, which is part of the financial sector regional banks. Very, very weird that software right here diverged from technology, actually beating the SPY handily up 0.57% with the technology sector down 0.22%. Same with semiconductors here down 0.84%. It was a very mixed day of trade with those who lost. We had defensive sectors lose. We had cyclical sensitive sectors lose, you know, rate sensitive sectors too. But at the top, it was very clear who the leaders were and that was the commodity driven sectors. Now diving into the charts, we can see that the NASDAQ 100 right here was actually down 0.6% and that had to do with Apple, that had to do with Nvidia and Microsoft. When they put up flat to down days, that's really gonna affect this index right here because those three stocks make up like 30 to 40% of the NASDAQ 100. But we did see the Dow Jones gain 0.34% here, same with the RSP. So the broader market actually did gain now, on the back of some hawkish Fed speak, we actually did see rates gain quite significantly. Look at the 10 year up 1%. Same here with the 30 year treasury. You can see up 1.04%. So, you know, rates did gain. And same at the lower end, you know, the three month yield did nothing. The two year yield was up 0.63%. And that actually did see bonds uh, lose quite a bit here today, but upbeat here in the after hours. So, we'll see what that looks like into Monday's trade. But the big talk of the town definitely was commodities. Look at silver up 6.49% here today. And that's because uh, gold up 1.6%. And let's actually dive into these a little bit more specifically. Gold, that's an all-time high close there for gold. Very close to all-time highs, less than a percentage point away. Silver, silver making highs as well. It's not quite all-time highs, but it's up there. I mean, if I just go on the monthly chart, you can see that, you know, all-time highs for silver is very close here to this 50 level. But you do have to understand that this is highs not seen since 2012 and very relevant in the grand scheme of things. At the same time, we did see quite a bit of volatility here in the dollar. And then crude actually not quite as volatile as gold or silver but you know quite the move since wednesday but still within our 78 to 88 dollar range i know it's a big range but it is what it is but let's dive into the s p 500 we saw quite a lot of stuff today now let's actually start on the weekly chart because the weekly chart has closed very interesting now i, I talk about this every single week i say this every single week and i'll keep saying it every single week you know we make a high higher high higher high, higher high, higher high, new all-time high on a weekly basis. That's bullish. Don't fight the trend. At the same time, we literally make highs all the way up to all-time highs 
with the trend in an uptrend on a weekly chart, that is bullish. You don't want to fight the trend in this scenario. You just want to be buyers of dips. At the same time, looking at the daily chart, right? Very similar situation, but zooming in to the price action this year or in the last couple of months, we see a couple of glaring things. We put a low right here and we've made higher highs, higher lows all the way to a new all time high. And this actually is the gamma flip zone 5300. So that's actually exactly where we found resistance here at this gamma flip zone. Now, now, bias did come in quite handily you know after that hawkish fed speak today we saw quite a drop sellers did come in in a very big way and then we saw a lot of those losses pod now if we hop onto the five minute chart we can actually see what that looks like in detail and this is where we opened right here that's when we opened the day so you can actually see we opened right gapped up traded all the way down to this level that's actually a significant move in the s p 500 especially on an opex day where there's a lot of volume and a lot of money so Calculating trillions of dollars of options expiring. Then we formed a bottom, moved all the way up and finished actually positive for the day. Very, very interesting when you look at it like that. So the bulls definitely did come in a big way right here and moved us all the way up. Now, moving back to the daily chart, there's a couple of things we need to look for into next week. Let's mark out our key levels. The 5300 right here, that is our core gamma resistance level. And then 51.95 right here. That's our gamma flip zone. So we're going to make this one pink. Okay. So for next week, what are we looking to? Let's just pull up the gamma chart. So this is the gamma flip. This is the call gamma resistance. If the call gamma resistance, this number right here moves to 5,400, that would be this strike right here. We're going to be buyers of dips, sellers of rips all the way to 5,400. And that would mean that any pullback we do get early on in the week, right? even here to the 5250 area, even here to the 5200 area. We do want to be buyers of that looking for higher price action because we probably will go to 5400, if not in May, definitely towards the start of June. We are in the window of weakness, so we can see a little bit of volatile swings in the market. But based on the momentum we've seen, I doubt that's really going to happen. We're not going to get another 5% pullback like we did in the month of April. Any pullbacks are going to be very minute and dips will be bought within a couple of days. This is the type of price action we get in bull markets. Now, if we don't move up to 5400 and keep the call gamma resistance at 5300, that means we probably want to be buyers of dips at the 5250, 5195 as well. So nothing changes at our levels to buy. Instead of looking to the 5400 level, we're just going to look to the 5300 area. If it does stay at 5300, I guess you can take shorts if you are a bear to the downside, but I wouldn't really with this type of strength, I would really just let the, let the bears play their games and then you just buy the dips. That's what I would do. So next week, 5250, 5195, you want to be buyers of dips looking to the 5300 area. And then if we do move up the tape to the 5400 area as your initial price target in the S&P 500. So that's the game plan for next week. The game plan is to buy dips at 5250, 5195 if we do get that low and then look to the 5300 area and potentially the 5400 area i would keep you guys updated as to how the gamma tape unfolds so we <coughs> so we got a bit of macro commentary here from bofa it's just going over the economic data we've received in the last two to three weeks and how that's going to impact financial markets as a whole and the tldr negative economic data surprises equals a lower 10-year yield incoming softer than expected april payrolls once 75k and April CPI 3.6% year over year 0.3% month over month pulled forward the first rate cut from November to September. The US 10 year yield has dropped from a peak of 4.7% to 4.35% today. The City Economic Surprise Index has rolled over meaningfully in recent weeks as economic data has shown a clear sign of softening. Good for yields, good for the inflation narrative. At negative 21.6, the index is close to the most negative reading since Jan. 2023. We think the softening data is the long-awaited response to tight monetary policy in the last few years, and we do not think it is an anomaly. The soft landing scenario is unfolding. A large divergence between the City Surprise Index and the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield has emerged, suggesting downside potential on the U.S. Treasury yield based on this divergence and on technical analysis. We think a decline from 4.35% to 3.25% and they see that as a good possibility and likely non-consensus. We note that the baseline BOFA rate forecast is for a 4.25% US Treasury yield at the end of both 2024 and 2025, suggesting a more modest duration overweight. Going from 4.35 to 3.25 is the contrarian play right now and it's actually what I've been championing for a while now. This is a post I made at the start of May, the 4th of May, pretty much when 
yields topped out. I said 80% chance that the 10 year yield high is likely in for the year. With Fed QT taper, issuance pressure is reduced by 20%. Long duration TLT risk to reward is asymmetrically skewed to the upside. So I've been on the trade that I do think rates are going to come down. Everybody was screaming for a 5% 10 year. At that point, you know we were going to go lower. And according to Bofa, the contrarian play right now is for rates to actually move lower. And that's probably what is likely going to happen, especially if we do get this weaker data tapering of quantitative tightening, which is easing essentially. And then we get rate cuts to really see, you know, rates move to this 3.25, three and a half area in a very, very quick time span, six to 12 months. And that will be good for equities in this time period. But for longer term, what does that say about the economy? It's yet to be seen. Great commentary here from Bofa. And we'll see how the next six to 12 months play out. Now, let's actually look at earnings, but not S&P 500. We looked at that yesterday. We looked at Europe earnings before. Now we're going to look at the Russell 2000. So this right here is blended earnings growth. And this right here is revenue growth. You can see that the Russell in aggregate is actually reporting positive earnings growth here of 0.9% with the best sectors being health and real estate and then com services materials and energy being a complete dumpster fire on the earnings front revenue looking very mixed as well although we're not seeing this type of movement in the revenue side real estate being the worst here at negative 9.4 percent and the russell 2000 reporting negative 0.3 percent revenue growth or sales growth in aggregate but if we dive into the specifics yes the blended growth rate is 0.9 percent for earnings but if you exclude the energy sector the growth rate for the index actually jumps to 14 point four percent kind of crazy when you think about that 1621 companies have reported in the russell 2000 59.5 percent above analyst expectations and the blended revenue growth rate excluding energy is actually 0.4 percent so we're actually seeing excluding energy 2024 q1 earnings here for the russell is actually the inflection point we've officially broken the earnings recession again excluding energy in the russell 2000 with this positive earnings momentum year in this quarter and hopefully this does does continue and we do get that exceptional earnings growth rate we are expecting in the Russell 2000 which is for the second quarter 1.34 percent right here and in the third quarter 21.33 percent growth crazy in the fourth quarter 49.82 percent for a calendar year 2024 growth rate of 19.37 percent so even though we're seeing a quarter one year posting negative 12.35 percent it just shows that this data is a little bit out of date had you look a week or two ago in the earnings season that's what you would have seen because a lot of Russell Energy Companies reported first, but we are actually reporting earnings that are a lot better than expected. And that is actually set to continue. So general consensus was that the second quarter was going to be the inflection point. It's looking like it's actually going to be this quarter with the most recent earnings I just showed you guys on the previous slides. Now, where does that leave us with valuation? According to this data right here, both is data, the Ford PE for the Russell 2000 is actually sitting at about 15 times, which is below the long-term average. As you can see right there, that's where we are right now. And and this probably means that small caps right now are a pretty good buying opportunity, especially considering the amount of earnings growth expected for the Russell 2000. Now, where does that leave us on a forward return basis? Now, I don't actually have the exact data here, but I have found a similar proxy. This right here is the Gotham yield. Now, the Gotham yield is just a valuation model, and it looks at a basket of about 1,400 securities, and then it gets like the top six to 700 and sort of like ranks them based on a couple of valuation metrics. And what you sort of get is a basket of stocks that looks a lot like the S&P 600. So we're going to use this as to see what returns we can expect. Now, the Gotham yield sits at 9.02%. Essentially, this number is sort of like the free cash flow yield with this basket of stocks. It's at the seventh percentile towards cheap. And essentially, what this means is that the average two-year forward returns, you're looking at about 21.6%, which is pretty much about 10% every single year compounded annually just thought i'd show that to you guys right there but let's move on and actually talk about a huge milestone we just hit a couple of days ago now this right here is major milestones in the dow jones industrial average it's essentially the days between each milestone the percentage return between each milestone and the annualized return between each milestone and normally when we do get to these milestones it's actually an opportunity to buy you want to buy these huge milestones because the returns 
tend to be quite amazing when you do look at it in aggregate. Now let's talk a bit about the economy. This is usual weekly earnings by percentile versus price. Wages have outpaced prices across the wage distribution. Lower income workers have seen the largest wage gains. And you can see this dark blue line is actually headline PCE. So pretty much inflation. This is what inflation has done over the last couple of years. This is what's actually happened with the wages. And you can see that wages have outpaced inflation. And that has actually led to real consumer spending being very very, very resilient, particularly since, you know, the end of October 2022. Yeah, we had a massive spike here. But just remove that and you can see that the trend is generally to the upside. Real consumer spending has been strong, especially in the last four to five months. And that is driven by disinflationary forces, as well as personal income and wages just remaining strong. When you get the mix of those two, real consumer spending increases. This is part of the reason why the economy has held up really, really well in the last two to three years, despite all of the doom and gloom going around. On Twitter. But it's not all good news. The doom and gloom is for good reason. And if we actually look at stuff like delinquent debt as a share of disposable income by category, delinquent credit card debt has risen sharply, but total delinquent debt remains low, even excluding student loans. So you can actually just see right here, but you can actually just see that delinquent debt is actually increasing on all fronts, credit card, mortgage, auto loans, student loans. And that is often not a good sign, but you could also look at this as a positive. If disposable income is to increase, generally speaking, debt will also increase as a result. You do also have to understand that right here, these levels are still historically low levels of delinquency debt. So it's not a major concern. When we start to get to maybe 3% above 2%, that's when we can really start to worry. But until then, I think things are fairly healthy for the most part. And what's also going to help delinquent debt and people with debt is actually rate cuts. I think the market has really moved rate cuts from November into September. And I think if we do continue to see softening of data, we're going to get rate cuts a lot quicker than we thought. Now, this is rate cuts that the market has priced in here in January CPI. You know, the market was pricing in six to seven rate cuts here at February. It was five to six here at March. It was three to four. And then at the most recent uh, PCE number, we were only pricing in potentially one to two rate cuts. That's pretty much been it. And after the latest CPI print, which we got right here, you know, the market has turned in a very big way. And I think the market got a bit overextended right here, pricing in 175 basis points worth of rate cuts. I think we got a bit extended to the downside right here, only pricing in 25. The truth is somewhere in the middle. And I do expect market pricing to meet somewhere here in the middle. And that's going to coincide with the tenure moving down, bonds getting a bit up, and that's going to be supportive for equity markets for the most part. So a lot of tailwinds here for the economy, for the consumer, for equity markets as a whole. Now, look Looking at a couple of charts, a chart I love looking at, and this is the margin debt model, essentially how much debt is in the system, specifically in the equity markets. And you can see that, well, we are above the historical trend. We are not in optimistic or overly stretched territory. We're actually sitting at the halfway point to the optimistic territory side and well off very optimistic. And you can see that right here in 2021, right here in 2008, and right here in the year 2000, very optimistic margin debt debt levels are a very, very good indicator of a potential downturn. And also what this tells us with margin debt only right here is that there's still juice left in the tank. And that's why we want to be long equities. It's why we want to have exposure to equities for the most part, particularly US equities. Now looking at the spread between the yield curve, this is double A corporate bonds versus US treasury bonds. And again, still historically low. We haven't seen yield spreads blow out. We can see them turning a bit here. That's what you get in markets. You get the support supply and demand dynamic. And until we actually see something like this, and this happens very, very quickly within the period of five to seven days, there's nothing really to worry about. And essentially, this is telling us that the risk premium for corporate bonds is not that high, and that investors believe that these companies will be able to pay the coupon on those bonds. And oftentimes, low spreads and compressed spreads, just an indicator of a bull market. We get them in bull markets like we did here in 2021 into 2022. When it did start to tick up in a big way, that's when we got that massive drawdown like we did in 2022. We can also see the same thing here with BAA corporate bonds, some of the lowest yield spreads we've ever had. And I believe this is going back to as far as 1999. I know the chart only goes back to 2019, but this is some of the lowest spreads we've ever seen 
seeing even lower than what they were here in 2021 and even right before the COVID situation. Now, looking at some charts, we're going to look at the XLK, which is the technology sector, the XLU, which is the utility sector, and the XLI, which is the industrial sector. And essentially, risk on, risk off, risk neutral sectors and how they're performing against the S&P 500. And just giving you a quick explanation of these charts, if it's moving up, it means said index or the XLK is outperforming the S&P 500. If it's moving down, it means the S&P 500 is outperforming said index. And we can see that the XLK, we have had a bit of a risk off period here, you know, throughout end of March into April, right? We had a bit of a risk off period. We're now bottomed out and it's back on to risk on and it's been risk on for the better part of five years in technology. Sure, there's been bumps in the road for sure, but in aggregate, you know, the last five years, if you've been risk on equities, you've done very, very well. At the same time, looking at utilities. Now, this is a bit concerning. As you can see right here, we've had a massive move in utilities and you guys know my opinion on this. I believe that this move mostly has to do with earnings more than the market getting defensive. But when you do look at a chart like this, the XLU versus the S&P 500, it is a bit concerning. Now, in the last five years, it has been far better to be a holder of S&P 500 because it's been a risk on environment, except for a few key areas here in 2022, and like we're seeing right now. But if you actually look at it, because this is a five-year chart, these are weekly candles. We're actually seeing a bottoming out process or a flatline process here in the XLU versus the S&P 500. So if we do actually continue to move down from here, that would actually be like a lower high back to risk on sentiment from there. Looking at the XLI versus the S&P 500, and it's been very mixed bag in the last five years. You know, the S&P 500 has outperformed the XLI, but if you look at it from the COVID bottom or even from the 2022 bottom, you know, we can definitely see that industrials, the XLI index has outperformed the S&P 500. It's been very choppy trade, particularly here in the last, what, nine to 10 months. And we could see that the S&P 500 has been the better performer former here for 2024. That being said, what well, these charts are pretty much telling us, but what XLI is telling us, and what XLK, XLU is telling us is that it's still a risk on environment. And that pretty much means you want to be holders of growth. Sure, you do want to hold value in your portfolio too, but you want to hold risk on sectors, stuff like technology, comm services, semiconductors, against stuff like utilities and staples. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, guys, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video video and leave a comment with the algorithm. Cheers.